Well, I'm delighted to be able to uh, welcome Julian Dale to be with us. And uh, in All Saints Church, Julian is most famous for his organization of our church pantomime. So you might think, what on earth is he doing up here? Well, Julian also has another life, which is that of a barrister. And uh, I thought it'd be good just to hear a barrister's point of view on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. One of the reasons that I believe I'm going to heaven, and uh, that's because of what God has done, nothing through what I have done, is because Jesus himself rose from the dead. And if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, well, our faith would be groundless. So I thought it'd be a good idea if we could perhaps invite someone like Julian to come and give his perspective on Jesus rising from the dead. But uh, first of all, Julian, tell us a little bit. How long have you been a barrister? Um, I've been a barrister now for 20 years. I've been in Eastbourne for 19 years. Um, uh, I was the third barrister to arrive in Eastbourne, and there are now 15 of us in chambers. And I guess being a barrister, you're dealing with contentious issues, arguments, people disagreeing with you, uh, seeing people upset and hurt, uh, a recipe for high stress. What do you do when you get home to sort of unwind? Um, I change into something more comfortable than my suit. Um, I like to play the piano, I like to sing, I like to spend time with my girls, um, I have a hammock in the garden, uh, and in the summer months, uh, a glass of Pims and lying in the hammock uh, right. is uh, a favourite. And as a barrister, Julian, one of the things that you will have to do is to assess evidence. What sort of things would a barrister look for when assessing the reliability of evidence? Um, to start off with, of course, you're looking at the witnesses. You're looking to see whether they have first-hand experience, uh, whether they're describing something that they've actually seen, they've felt, they've tasted. Um, you're looking at whether those witnesses have any ulterior motives, uh, whether they've got any kind of hidden agenda uh, for what they're saying. You're looking at the first, uh, how quickly uh, they've recorded their memories. So uh, has there been, you know, a few days, many years, sometimes many decades uh, before, uh, uh, before uh, they, uh, they put things down in writing? Um, you're also looking, though, at the, the wider circumstance of the case. Uh, I think in the public perception, circumstantial evidence is kind of deemed to be in some way very weak evidence. Uh, but very often... Um, the circumstantial evidence is, is very clear uh, pointer to where the truth is. Um, so the analogy I, I would use, and I, I train young barristers, is if you put a cat and a mouse in a room together uh, and leave for half an hour, if when you come back the mouse has disappeared, then there's an inference, there's a strong circumstantial case that the cat has had an early dinner. You wouldn't convict the cat until you'd checked the skirting boards to make sure the mouse hadn't escaped. But if you check the skirting boards and there's no way for the mouse to escape, then you know that Tiddles doesn't need any food that night. So the, a circumstantial case, nobody's seen the cat eat the mouse, but the circumstances are such that you can be pretty darn sure uh, that that's what's happened. Thank you. That's uh, really helpful. Christians place great weight on Jesus having risen for reasons I explained earlier. Do you think the evidence for the resurrection merits such a conclusion? Because uh, people don't normally rise from the dead, do they? Uh, but here we're trying to suggest something that would be seemingly impossible has actually happened in human history. Do you think there are any merits in such a conclusion? Yes. Um, linking back to what I've just said, uh, firstly, of course, you need to look at the witnesses. Um, uh, and in the first four books of the, the New Testament, we have four biographies of Jesus. Two of them... Um, uh, Matthew and John, written by people who were there, who saw what was going on, who heard Jesus' teaching, who were his disciples, um, both by church tradition and most academics and scholars would agree uh, that those are first-hand accounts and the clues are in the texts, uh, particularly in John. It's very obvious to see which of the disciples he is. He refers to himself. Um, so there we have two first-hand accounts, two gospel accounts. The first... Uh, uh, the first biography written was that written by, uh, uh, by Mark, 
Um, and again, by church tradition and uh, most scholars would agree uh, that that was written about 25 to 30 years after Jesus' death, um, which sounds like a long period of time, but if I say that um, so far as Alexander the Great is concerned, the first biography we have of him is 400 years after his death, then to have four biographies written uh, within 60 years of Jesus' death I think is an extraordinary body of very convincing uh, uh, eyewitness account with regard to two. Uh, we've got Mark, who was uh, traveling with Peter. Uh, that was likely to be written in Rome. And, of course, with Luke, uh, we've got somebody who deliberately set out to draw on the various sources of evidence there were. Uh, he almost certainly had reference to Mark's gospel as he was writing, but he also clearly drew on other sources of, uh, of reference, spoke to, other, uh, spoke to other disciples. We believe that Luke, of course, as a doctor, uh, was the traveling companion of Paul. Thank you. But uh, surely it's quite possible that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John got together and said, uh, well, look, uh, we want to present a case that Jesus has written. Let's all perhaps approach it from a slightly different angle so that we can uh, persuade people that it's happened when, in fact, all they're doing is actually deceiving. How do we know there wasn't some sort of collusion like that? Well, we have... 2,000 years of examination of the, uh, of the Gospels, and Christianity, of course, uh, is, uh, is a faith where everybody and anybody can read the Gospels and get to know them. There, is, there are some faiths, and we won't mention them, where there are dark secrets. You have to go through levels, and then you have more dark secrets revealed to you. Christianity is the exact opposite of that. Everybody can look. There is clearly no hidden agenda uh, in the Gospels. Uh, they... Uh, all four of the uh, uh, Jesus' biographers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, they all expressly say what they are intending to do, uh, which is to convey the good news of what they have seen, what they know to be the truth. Um, the scholars would say, and I'm no biblical scholar, the scholars would say that they were written in different locations for different audiences and at distinctly different times. Um, as I say, Mark uh, is uh, widely acknowledged to have been the first gospel written about 25 to 30 years after Jesus' death. Um, we know that Luke had reference to Mark, and it's probable that Matthew uh, had reference to Mark's gospel as they were writing, but the other sources used. It's, it's an area, actually, that I'm quite passionate about because the critics would have it both ways. The critics would have it, firstly, um, that there's some sort of collusion between them. They've got their heads together, they've all decided to come up with a similar account. But those exact same critics would then point to differences in their accounts and say, aha, you can't get your story together, this just proves that it's not truthful. When I'm looking and comparing statements, um, one of the things that immediately springs off the page is if the same phrases have been used, uh, if, if there is obvious collusion between the accounts, and to my mind, the differences, and they are on the whole minor differences between the Gospels, actually just reinforces uh, that each of the Gospel writers was trying to write an honest, straightforward account of their experiences. And of course, they all have different experiences. They're drawing on different sources. And so there are bound to be slight differences in what they perceive to be the most important part of what they were allowing. Some people might argue that perhaps there's a different explanation. Perhaps they got Jesus down from the cross, they put some cold water and they tried to resuscitate him. Or perhaps uh, uh, it was an hallucination. And in fact, he never rose, but somehow there was an hallucination. They all see, saw something that they thought was Christ, but they were deceived. Or perhaps uh, the body was stolen. Perhaps there's some other explanation for the empty tomb. All right. Um, it seems to me that... Uh, you need to look at two, two, parts, uh, of, uh, uh, two parts of the evidence. Firstly, you need to see whether there is convincing evidence that Jesus died. And then you need to look and see whether there is convincing and firm evidence that Jesus was alive again three days later. And if you have those two things, uh, then you have a mystery for which Christianity has an answer, but otherwise we have none. So just looking at the first of those, is there evidence that Jesus died? Um, firstly, the Romans were expert at executing people on the cross. Um, it was a barbaric and particularly effective way of killing people. Um, initially, uh, people would be whipped, they'd be scourged, 
uh, the whipping would be particularly brutal. It would usually be 39 strokes. 40 was said to put you one stroke away from death, uh, and the whip would have been tipped either with bone uh, or with, uh, with metal. Uh, and people were known to die just from that whipping. Uh, so before you ever get to dragging uh, your cross to the point of execution and being nailed on there, you were in a very, very poor state indeed. Um, you then would have uh, been expected to carry the crossbar of your cross to the point of execution. Jesus didn't manage that. We know uh, a gentleman called Simon that was, that was pulled in to carry the cross. Uh, you then have uh, large metal nails uh, put through your wrists to secure you to the cross and through your feet. And you're then hoisted up and left there uh, until you die. Um, the, Roman, uh, the Romans were expert at doing it. There are no reported accounts of people surviving crucifixion, um, save there's a particular Jewish historian who gives an account of two people who were crucified. Uh, for some reason, I'm not quite sure of the Roman authorities relented, and they were brought down from the cross before death. Uh, one of those survived, the other one died nonetheless. Um, but it was a very effective way of killing people. Um, with Jesus, uh, when they believed he was dead, they stuck a spear in his side, and we're told from the Gospels, that water and blood flowed out. Uh, I'm no medic, but I know that uh, uh, there are many, many articles written about this. Uh, that is a sign of piercing the heart, uh, there being a separation of water in the sack around the heart and um, blood from the heart. Uh, and then once the body was taken down, it was wrapped, uh, as was customary, in about 100 pounds worth of linen. So if there was any life at all left uh, in the person taken down from the cross, they would then be asphyxiated. And, of course, Jesus was then left in a cold tomb without food, without water, without any medication. Um, and a stone weighing somewhere between one and two tons was put across the door of the tomb. That stone was sealed by the Roman authorities, uh, the assistance of the temple authorities, and then there were guards put there. So even if, even if, and I don't believe for one second this to be the truth, even if there was a flicker of life left in Jesus when he was taken down from the cross, being bound, asphyxiated, and left in a stone tomb, um, there is, to my mind, absolutely no chance uh, that Jesus survived the process of whipping and crucifixion. That was a rather lengthy answer to the first part of what you need if you, if you have a resurrection. Did Jesus die? I think the evidence is absolutely compelling that he did. The second part, though, um, was the body stolen? Um, was there a hallucination? Um, I think... My answer to that second part can be much quicker uh, because if the evidence of Jesus' death is compelling and convincing, the evidence that he was back three days later is overwhelming to my mind. Um, he was seen by many, many people. Uh, Glenn's already referred to the fact he ate with them, he spoke with them, he cooked up a barbecue on the beach for them. Um, we're told in uh, 1 Corinthians, one of Paul's uh, letters to the, uh, uh, to the church at Corinth, uh, that on one occasion when Jesus uh, was present after his death, uh, there were 500 people there. And effectively, Paul says, if you don't believe me, lots of them are still alive. Go and ask them. So there was absolutely no question in the minds of the disciples, who at the time of Jesus' death uh, had been cowering, uh, denying that they even knew him in the case of Peter, uh, and entirely dispirited, um, Within a few days, uh, those same people were energized with a certainty of Jesus' return, uh, and the circumstantial evidence flowing from that, I think, is overwhelming, because they then went on uh, to set Jerusalem aflame uh, with uh, their Christianity, uh, and then uh, the known world at that time, the Roman Empire, uh, very quickly, uh, the, uh, the good news spread. When I first came to Eastbourne, Julian, uh, <clears throat> about eight years ago, you told me that you were not very sure in, in your faith. Since then, what swung it for you? Why are you now a committed Christian? I guess I've actually bothered to read the Bible, which is not something I'd spent much time doing. I, I think a lot of people leave lives of... Um, uh, distracted lives. Uh, we, we entertain ourselves with pointless distractions. Um, Luke's Gospel takes probably less than two hours to read, uh, but I think probably many, many people haven't bothered to do that. So I've, uh, I've done a lot of reading. 
um, both books and online. I find there's an enormous amount of material you can read online. You need to be a little bit careful uh, that it's the, uh, uh, the real deal online, obviously. Um, but what really, what really sways it for me with regard to the resurrection um, is the circumstantial evidence. Uh, it's uh, the way in which the disciples uh, went from uh, absolute despair and disenchantment uh, to uh, absolute certainty that Jesus had returned. Uh, we look at Peter going from a denial. Uh, within a few weeks, he was preaching and converting thousands of people uh, a day. Uh, and they were, of course, they were preaching the resurrection in Jerusalem at exactly the time when if it wasn't true, if the body had been stolen, if the Roman authorities or temple authorities had taken it, they could have wheeled out Jesus' body and that would have been an end to it. They were preaching in Jerusalem the resurrection at exactly the time when everyone in Jerusalem knew that Jesus had died. This idea of the swoon, maybe he wasn't entirely dead, is actually a very recent idea. At the time, everybody knew he was dead, and there was no question about it. They'd seen him brutally killed. They'd seen him buried. Um, uh, So, uh, And finally, of course, of the disciples, 10 of the 11 disciples then went to their deaths, proclaiming the truth of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, Well... You wouldn't do that unless you were absolutely sure uh, that he had died and that the, he had then returned and that that was a significant piece of information that you needed to pass on. So the fact that uh, uh, they preached the gospel and were martyred for doing so says to me that they knew the truth of what they had seen. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you.